So we're going to read through uh, two full chapters of our text. It's a lot to read. There's four chapters in Exodus, but we're going to begin with chapter 7. So if you'll open up your books to Exodus chapter 7, we're going to find God's people, the Israelites, in Egypt. And they've been working hard. They are under, uh, under control of a pharaoh who has in the world's eyes, complete authority over his kingdom in Egypt. And this pharaoh, this pharaoh is going to clash, is going to come up against a God that is giving him directions and commands. And we're going to see how his responses are and and what what those responses lead to. Okay, Raise your hand if you're at at Exodus chapter 7. Excellent. Good job. You guys are fast. You guys flip those pages fast. Let's take a look. Exodus chapter 7. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servant became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is the Nile and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch it out. Stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank so that all the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. 
So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not even take this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. This is the first of how many plagues in Egypt? Ten. So the chapters that we're going to be looking at today are going to look at the first nine. And next week, you guys will be learning about the final plague, the final blow to Pharaoh and his kingdom. Now, every ruler ever has been placed and created into this world by God. Now, Pharaoh at this time might think, because the people worship me and I am like a god, I'm kind of a big deal. I have this kingdom that is large. I have one of the most powerful and life-giving rivers flowing right through my kingdom. Life is good. People bow down to me. I have all these servants, and life is good. But we're going to see, after these plagues, his life isn't really that great. It's going actually really poorly. And we're going to see that all these plagues that come onto Egypt and onto Pharaoh and all the Egyptians are a display of God's awesome power and his authority over his creation. So point number one, as we step into these other plagues, we're going to see um, we need to observe God's supreme power over creation. Point number one, observe God's supreme power over creation. Now, God is a strong and powerful God. If he made everything that we know, everything that we see and interact with, he has full control over it, and he displays that in these chapters in Exodus. Now, the the plagues in sequence look like this. Blood in the Nile, frogs that emerged and covered all the bits of land in Egypt in chapter eight, frogs. The third plague was gnats, small flying insects that were just everywhere and in everything in your face. You could not escape them. The fourth plague was flies in chapter eight. The fifth plague was death to livestock. All the animals of the field were struck down in the land of Egypt. But God spared, in these plagues, God spares his people, the Israelites. They don't suffer these plagues. Plague number six, boils. Really painful, irritating skin abnormalities or imperfections that are so painful you can't often even sleep. They're painful to move around and they are all over your body. Hail, in chapter 9, the seventh plague, hail that destroys crops and destroys any living thing that is not protected from it. The plague number 8, locusts in chapter 10, and finally darkness in chapter 10 also, the ninth one. So all of these plagues are targeted very purposefully at things that Egyptian people looked up to and worshipped. People found security and comfort in bowing down to false gods or fake gods and putting their hope and trust in those, those fake gods for, um, for taking care of them. Does that make sense? It's, it's kind of abnormal maybe for some of you to think, I'm going to worship this creature with a frog head in a man's body or I'm going to worship this creature that has the head of a bull because I want to have fertility or I, I want my crops to prosper or I want my, uh, my family to have many kids in it. People at that time in Egypt were worshiping gods that were made up that were not the one true God. Does that make sense? They were finding ways to be distracted in the back. Yes, sir. Gnats. Oh, yes, gnats number three. Gnats are tiny flying insects. 
smaller than flies. Mm -hmm. Yes. They worship, yeah. Worship the cow, right? Worship, worship the creation rather than the creator, right? They found things around them to worship and bow down to everything and, and anything other than the one true God, Yahweh. Trash things? Trash cans. Yeah, maybe. Things that, that did not provide hope in a future for them, okay? And, they, and the sequence of these plagues came as this. The first three were um, kind of annoying, messed with the minds and the emotions of, of the Egyptians. The second three were more painful, right? So the flies, the livestock, disease, and the boils. It's kind of ramping up as the plagues continue on, leading up to the tenth and final plague, which you'll find out next week, a little foreshadowing has to do with death of the firstborn. Now, the last three that we're going to look at today, the hail, the locusts, and the darkness in chapters 9 and 10 are more deadly and psychological, affecting the mindset or the way that you think um, about your life and, and your future. Okay? So we're going to hop over to chapter 9. We're going to skip chapter 8. We discussed the plagues in chapter 8, the frogs the gnats and the flies. In chapter 9, things are going to get a little more intense. Okay, will you read with me here? Chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day, the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Verse 8, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln. Let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Verse 13, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. Let's pause here. God is saying, I could have just ended this all for you, but I'm continuing to be patient. I'm continuing to use you as an object lesson for the world to see that there is no one like Yahweh. There is no one on earth like the God of Israel. Okay? Verse 16, we're going to carry on. But for this purpose, I, this is God speaking through Aaron, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. 
You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Now there's this back and forth thing where Moses and Aaron will come out and address Pharaoh and they'll say, the Lord says, let his people go. And there's this game where Pharaoh is going back and forth and he's like, okay, that was really intense. That plague was really harmful and hurtful. Tell your God to just take these away and then you'll go and then your people can go. That's fine, just, just make it stop. And it goes back and forth and Pharaoh is bargaining with Moses, bargaining with God. Ultimately, his heart state does not change. His heart is still hardened towards God, towards the people of Israel. Now, you might be thinking, I'm not like, I'm not being that mean to a people. There's, there's no people that look up to me as leader, right? But at the same time, we need to look at the attitude of our heart. So point number two, check the attitude of your heart. You might not relate with Pharaoh. You might say, I'm nothing like Pharaoh. But if you and your heart are hearing from God through his word and you're, re- and you're saying no to it, you are, you are rejecting what God is, is calling you to do, what he's commanding you to do. You might have more similarities with a Pharaoh that we're reading than you think. Okay, we need to check, check your heart. Psalm 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Something that you all can do is cry out to God. He is a God that listens. He is a God that hears. And you can trust that when you cry out to God with a heart that is pure, that wants to honor and serve him, you say, God, bring to my attention the ways that I am against you. Bring to my attention the ways that I'm offending you. And if you talk to your parents and say, mom and dad, can you, can you show me the ways that I'm disobedient to you or the ways that I'm disobedient to God? And if you're doing that with a heart that is, is pure, that wants to honor God and obey God, not for your own benefit like Pharaoh. Pharaoh is saying, make it stop, make it stop. And he's not trying to, um, to repent and turn away from his ways. He just wants the pain to stop and the plagues to cease. But if you talk to your parents, you talk to someone that you look up to that knows you really well, they're going to help you to understand maybe the attitude of your heart. It's really important. It's super important. Now, we live in a day where there's... Um, modern technology, you have a TV. There's no TVs in Egypt at this time. There's no video games at this time. There's, there's no cars or trucks at this time. And you might not make that connection to like, yeah, there's flies, there's frogs, there's boils. Like, it, was, it must have been really hard for them, right? But there are some similarities between you and Israel that I'd like to draw your attention to. So Israel at this time was under bondage and slavery to a dictator named Pharaoh, one that has complete authority over the entire land of Egypt. Now, if you are in a position where you don't, you don't have or, or know uh, Christ as Savior, you don't have Christ in your heart, we're either um, a slave to our sin and we obey the desires of our flesh and we and we do what we feel like we want to do, similar to Pharaoh, or we're slaves to righteousness and we've been bought with the blood of Jesus and now we follow and obey whatever he says. So there's something to consider. Who who is it that has the authority over your life? Are you making all the decisions for yourself? Are you doing whatever you feel like doing? Or are you looking to God and his word Are you looking to God to give you the direction and the steps that you should be taking in order to please and honor him? We'll conclude here with Colossians um, 1. And I don't think I called out point number three. But point number three, reflect on the similarities between Israel and yourself. Think about this. You need someone to save you and pull you out of your sin, similar to how... Israel needed God to rescue them and pull them out of slavery in Egypt. 
You need God to save you from your sin. You need God to save you from your position. We're stuck. We're stuck in our sin. We can't get ourselves out. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And it's only by the blood of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, his perfect sacrifice that we are able to be made right with God who is perfect um, in justice and judgment, perfect in kindness, perfect in holiness. His character has no flaws and we can trust him. We're gonna see next week, and you, I hope that you're all here, just the kind of steps that God takes to protect and, and look over his people. And it's a foreshadowing to the cross. So I hope that you guys are here next week so that way you can kind of see the end of this story of the plagues and the exodus of the people of Israel being rescued from Egypt, okay? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to, to reflect on your goodness to reflect on the way you look out for your people. God, you are strong and you are powerful over all creation. There is none like you, God. Help us to respond appropriately to the power that you displayed. Help us to respond with a heart that is humble, that is looking at our sin and is wanting to repent and turn away and turn to you, God. Turn to you for salvation, God. Will you um, bless these times here with... Um, these small groups, and God, may your word speak truth into their lives. In Jesus' name I pray.